welcome to the Cisco Support Community. Uh, today we present a live Cisco Support Community Expert Series webcast, and our topic today is going to be configuration, design, and troubleshooting of Cisco Nexus 1000. My name is Francine Richards, and I will be moderating today's event. Our expert joining me today is Louis Wada. Louis Wada is a technical leader in the services organization for Cisco. Wada's primary background is in data center technologies, servers, storage, switches, arrays, network switches, and enterprise service hypervisors. As a customer assurance engineer and systems engineer, WADA currently supports beta and early field trials on new Cisco software and hardware. He has more than 15 years of experience in a wide variety of data center applications and is interested in data technologies oriented toward data center virtualization and orchestration. Prior to Cisco, WADA was a system in administrator for GET, I'm sorry, GTE government systems. He has a Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Science from North Carolina State University. Welcome, Lewis. Thank you. Our expert panelists are Robert Burns and Steve Winters. They will help in answering some of your technical questions during the event. Now, I'd like to briefly outline the format for today's expert series event. Our expert will start with a presentation on Cisco Nexus 1000 for the first hour of the program. And then you will provide an answer to the question, what do Cisco Nexus 1000 and Coca-Cola have in common? Stay tuned for that, and then we'll dive into the live question submissions from the audience for the remainder of today's event. During our live presentation, you may submit your technical questions to be answered by our presenter and the expert panelists using the Q&A box on the right-hand side of the console. The team of technical experts is well-versed in Cisco Nexus 1000, so please begin posting your questions now to give us the best chance of answering them. If you experience any technical issues, please post your question in the chat. We'll be asking polling questions during this webcast, and we highly encourage you to participate by answering them. You may also download a copy of today's PDF presentation using the link in the chat window. And remember to Submit your questions during the event so that our panel of experts can answer them later in the webcast. Now, let's get started with today's event. I'm going to start off with a polling question. What is your level of experience with Nexus 1000B? A, Nexus 1000B, what is it? B, I've heard of Nexus 1000B but not deployed it. C, I've played with it in a lab environment and D, I'm running it in production. So please take a moment to answer that so that the expert can tailor their presentation to your needs. And now with that, I would like to hand the mic over to our expert, Louis Wada, who will cover Cisco Nexus 1000. Thank you. Can you guys uh, hear me well? I assume that's yes. So uh, we're going to go over configuration, design, and troubleshooting of the Cisco Nexus 1000B. Uh, we're going to cover you know, just some basic ideas and things you should be thinking about when you want to deploy the product, uh, some gotchas, things to watch out for, uh, things we've learned through four years of, of actually uh, working with the product at Cisco. There we go. Uh, so here's the agenda. Uh, we're going to go over the current Nexus 1000 uh, V releases and new features. We'll go over licensing. Uh, we'll talk about the virtual supervisor module, which you need to be aware of uh, when you deploy the VSM. Uh, we'll go over the virtual Ethernet module, uh, what you need to be aware of when you deploy that, uh, some troubleshooting issues with that. We'll go over upgrades, because we always get a lot of questions about upgrades now, so we'll go over uh, uh, things to do for upgrades. And if there's time, we'll talk about the Cisco Nexus 1010 and 1110. Uh, if there's not time, uh, the slides will be as part of an appendix uh, in the slide deck that will be available for download. Now let's talk about the current releases and uh, new features that will be coming for the Nexus 1000V. Uh, so right off the bat, yesterday we released Nexus 1000V for Hyper-V. Uh, so that is now a shipping product. It's been in uh, alpha, pre-beta, and then beta for well over a year now. Uh, but we actually released the official product last night, so it is now an official Cisco Nexus 1000V version that customers who are running Hyper-V can download and use. Uh, now the Hyper-V code is actually running on Cisco Nexus OS 5.x, 
So it's a little bit different code version than what ESX is running. Uh, our goal, obviously, is to get the Hyper-V and the ESX code to be on the same code tree. Uh, but right now, they're a little bit different. So, But in the future, expect those guys to both be on the same code tree. Uh, now, the Hyper-V code does work with Hyper-V for Windows Server 2012, and it also has the uh, requirement that it needs SCVMM 2012 Service Pack 1. And now on the ESX side, we have two versions. We have uh, the 1.52 or 1.5x code train and the 2.1 code train. The 2.1 obviously being the most recent, it's got a lot of new features in it, including the VC plugin and vTracker. It also has Cisco TrustSec support. And we also made a lot of changes to the licensing in 2.1. We actually split the licensing into a free model into an, and then an, a license model, which is we call advanced. And we'll talk about that in the licensing section. Uh, the 1.5x code train is basically just on a sustaining code. Uh, we have 1.5, 1.51a, and 1.52. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll probably have a 1.52b or 1.53, but uh, we are obviously making, trying to improve the 2.x code, and the 1.5 code is really just kind of on a sustaining, sustaining role. Hmm. There we go. Uh, so 2.1 features, what's new in 2.1? Uh, 2.1 came out in November, uh, but we still see a lot of customers that are on a 1.5 or 1.4 code train. So we'll go over what's new in 2.1 uh, kind of to try and see, you know, is it worth it for you to upgrade? And, and it really is worth it to upgrade. The biggest change, obviously, is the licensing, uh, the Cisco Trust Tech support. Uh, VTracker is a really cool application. What VTracker does is it allows the Nexus 1000V to go out and talk to v VMware vCenter and pull down VM-specific information and show it to the network admin uh, on the Nexus 1000V. So the network admin can actually, through VTracker, see the uptime for a VM, how much CPU, how much memory it's using. Uh, so it's really cool. It actually gives the network admin the ability to see a lot more in-depth information about the actual VM that he may be troubleshooting. Uh, the VC plugin is pretty much the same thing, but just for the VMware admin. Uh, what we do through the plugin is we actually take the Nexus 1000V config and we make a lot of it visible to the VMware admin through vCenter. We made a lot of VSM HA improvements, and those HA improvements allowed us to now support VSM split between different data centers, and we'll talk about that in the VSM section. Uh, we also now have the support for VEM remote branch support. So you can actually have uh, a VEM module on an ESX host that's at, say, a remote branch, oper uh, remote branch, like, for example, at a bank. And the latency between that ESX host and the VSM that will be back in the data center can be anywhere around 100 milliseconds of latency. So it allows you to uh, actually have the VSM manage ESX hosts that may be over a long-haul connection. Uh, we greatly enhanced the installer, so the installer has really been improved. And the same thing for upgrades. We made a lot of improvements in the upgrades to make it work a little bit better. So what's coming? Well, the next release should be this summer. It's going to be for ESX. It'll be 2.2. The big thing is increased scale. Uh, we've heard from a lot of customers, you know, I like Nexus 1000V, but I need more scale. I need more VEM support. I need more VEs and more ETH port support. So we've listened, we've worked on it, and in the 2.2 release, we're going to double the numbers. So we'll go from 64 VEMs to 128 VEMs. We're going to increase the number of ports per host, and we're going to increase the number of overall ports per VSM. Uh, it's going to be 4,000 in 2.2, and it's currently 2K in the current version, so there's a doubling there. You're also going to see us evolve VXLAN. The VXLAN today requires multicast. In 2.2, VXLAN is going to have a unicast mode, so you no longer need to configure or use multicast to get VXLAN to work. Uh, there will be a MAC address distribution as an option with VXLAN, and what that's going to do is actually push uh, all the configuration down into the VEM modules themselves so they'll know exactly where every VM is and which VXLAN segment it's on, uh, which is, should greatly reduce the amount of traffic of the VEM modules trying to actually find where different VMs are. And then we're also going to have a VXLAN gateway. Uh, we don't have a VXLAN gateway today. Uh, we we kind of depend in the VM world on VMware vShield Edge or the ASA 1000V. Uh, so this will be a standalone VXLAN gateway. It will run as a VM. Uh, and it'll actually be able to take VMs that are on a VXLAN and then transition their traffic over to talk to the rest of the world on just regular uh, VLANs. So what's coming beyond 2.2? Well, 
OpenStack support. We're definitely working on OpenStack. We're also working on KVM and Zen support as well. Uh, we want to be multi-hypervisor, multi-cloud with the Nexus 1000V, and we're working very hard to get there. Uh, you're also going to see us increase the configuration limits. So with 2.2, we're going to double the numbers, but hopefully this calendar year we're going to increase them yet again. Uh, so again, we're, we're hearing from customers. We need more scale, and we're, we're diligently working to get there. Uh, you're going to see us support the Citrix NetScaler and the Imperver WAF applications on our Nexus 1110. And then eventually we're going to try and tie those into the Nexus 1000V with VPath as well. Okay, so those were the current and future, uh, future versions. Let's go over licensing. And, and this is really a huge change for us. So, you know, in 2.1, you know, we basically said, okay, we're going to make the majority of the Nexus 1000V free. So we created two versions, the Essentials version and the Advanced version. The Essentials is the free version. So you would think, okay, but you're going to scale it back. Well, we didn't actually. There's, there's only four features that are not in the Essentials version. That's Cisco TrustSec support, DHCP snooping, IP source guard, and dynamic ARP inspection. Every other feature, all the scale is there in the Essentials version. It's free. Uh, you get a 512 socket license with no expiration date. So with a 512 socket license, you can uh, essentially support 64 four socket hosts connected to the Nexus 1000B. Uh, there's no expiration and, and we're going to support upgrades as well. So that this is for 2.1 when 2.2 comes out uh, and you're on the free version, you'll be upgraded to 2.2 as well. Uh, the Essentials version or the free mode is the default mode when you do a new install of the Nexus 1000V. Uh, when it comes to support, you have two options. You can pay nothing and use our Cisco support forms for support, or you can actually pay for a service contract for tax support. So you can get the, the software for free, but just pay for support. Now, the advanced version requires a license. It's for customers that want those additional security features or for customers that want to run the virtual security gateway. Uh, going forward, the virtual security gateway will no, no longer be a standalone application. Uh, it will be tied to the advanced license on the Nexus 1000V. For customers that have licenses for the 1.x code, when you upgrade from 1.4 or 1.5 to 2.1, uh, you will automatically put you in the advanced mode and move your licenses over into advanced mode. Now you also, since you paid for licenses, get the ability to call your Cisco account team and say, hey, I have licenses for Nexus 1000V. Uh, I understand I can get virtual, virtual security gateway for free if I have licenses. And the answer is yes. And your account team can get you those licenses uh, by submitting a request form. So if you're currently licensed today, uh, you can get VSG for free just by upgrading. Now there's no requirement that even if you have licenses that you have to run in advanced mode. So for example, if you have a 10 socket license, uh, and you've been on the fence about whether or not you should buy more licenses and you're not using any of the, uh, any of the advanced security tools, you, you don't have to use the advanced license. You can switch from advanced to essentials and then go from 10 socket license to a 512 socket license. So it's totally up to you. There's no requirement that you have to run in advanced mode if you have a license. Uh, so this is a question that comes up a lot, and the question is about overdraft licenses. And what are they? Well, they're basically just extra licenses that are there for use in temporary situations. Uh, by default, I think you get 16 extra sockets, but uh, depending on the number of licenses you've purchased, you may get uh, a little bit more. We try to keep a, a certain buffer zone there. Uh, now, these can only be used after a valid license, license is installed. So you can't use an overdraft license uh, if you don't have enough licenses to cover all the hosts that are currently connected. Uh, so it's just meant as a temporary situation, for example, if you're migrating from uh, older servers to new servers, you know, we don't want to have to require you to buy a license just because you want to get off some old hardware, and that's the idea behind the overdraft licenses, just as a temporary solution to get you over them. Now, if you're using overdraft licenses, you'll never be ref refused support. Uh, we may just say, hey, you're using overdraft licenses. If you're going to use them for a longer term, you need to buy some licenses or switch back to essentials. Okay, so that's licensing. There, there we go. So now we're at polling question number two. And this is always interesting to see. So which licensing version do you think you will deploy? A, the essentials, which is the free version. B, the advanced, which is the uh, licensed version. Or C, you're not sure yet. 
Uh, so I think, uh, I don't know if I can post the, the polling question. So hopefully someone will post it. There it goes. I can see it now. And we'll give you guys a few minutes to try and answer that. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on. And let's talk about the virtual supervisor module. So what we're going to do in this section is we'll go over the life cycle of the virtual supervisor module, or the VSM. We'll talk about what it is. We'll go over some planning options, uh, how to do the installation, and some, some minor troubleshooting. So first, let's go over the Nexus 1000V architecture. That way we can understand what the virtual supervisor module really is. And so when we were developing the Nexus 1000V, now, the developers kind of used a, a technology that we already had, and that technology was the idea of a modular switch, uh, a Catalyst 6500 or a Nexus N7K. Uh, the idea that you have a chassis with a backplane, you have supervisor modules, and you have line cards. Well, the Nexus 1000V is based off this base, same technology, only in our world, the supervisor modules are virtual machines called virtual supervisor modules. There's an active and there's a standby. They're both virtual machines. The line cards for us are called virtual Ethernet modules, and they're the data plane. They actually move the data, and they're a little bit, it's a little piece of code that runs on the actual hypervisor, both on ESX and on Hyper-V. Now, in our world, the back plane for the Nexus 1000V is the actual network. So the VSM, which is the control plane, programs the VEM modules over the network. Now, the, the, the big difference, obviously, for us is that while a Catalyst, I think, can go up to 13 slots and a 7K can go up to, uh, I think it's four, 10 or 14, um, we can go up to 66 slots. And then eventually we'll be able to go up to 134 slots uh, in the next release. So uh, it, just think of the Nexus 1000V as a very large chassis-based switch. Now, the VSM, or the Virtual Supervisor Module, is a virtual machine, whether it's on ESXi, uh, a Nexus 1010 or 1110 appliance, or on Hyper-V. It's our control plane solution, and it's always responsible for programming and managing the virtual Ethernet modules, and for communicating with the hypervisor's management applications. For ESX, this is VMware vCenter, and for Hyper-V, this is Microsoft's SCVMM 2012. One VSM HA pair today can manage up to 64 VEMs, so that's basically a virtual 66-slot chassis. Obviously, in the future, that number is going to increase. Uh, now, the Nexus 1000V can also coexist with a VMware vSwitch, a VMware distributed virtual switch, a Microsoft Logical or a Microsoft Native switch at the same time. Uh, you, you're not required to run the Nexus 1000V and only the Nexus 1000V uh, on your hypervisor. We do coexist with, with all of those uh, virtual switches uh, on the different hypervisors. Now let's talk about the VSM for Hyper-V versus for ESX. So first, today, unfortunately, a VSM is either for all Hyper-V hosts or all ESXi hosts. Uh, you can't have a VSM connect to both uh, ESX hosts and Hyper-V hosts at the same time. Now, so that's something, hopefully, a little bit farther down the road we may be able to accomplish, but right now uh, it's, it's, one, it's all one hypervisor or all another hypervisor. Uh, now, as far as the VSM, it's a virtual machine. It can run anywhere. So a VSM that's attached to Hyper-V uh, uh, Hyper hosts can actually be running on an ESXi host. We really don't care. Just as long as the VSM is running on a supported hypervisor, which is Hyper-V ESX or the Nexus uh, 1010 or 1110 appliance, it, it doesn't matter that it's connected to a different type of hypervisor for its VEM. Uh, you will notice uh, as you start playing that the configs are slightly different for Hyper-V versus ESX, and that has to do with the way that Microsoft uh, and VMware uh, changed their, you know, did their networking. They're just a little bit different, uh, so the configs are a little different. So don't expect that you'll be able to take a config from an ESX VSM uh, and copy and paste it into a, a Hyper-V VSM and have it work. You're going to have to do a little bit of manual changing to get uh, to get those things to work. Okay, so let's take a quick look at the polling. And it looks like we've got uh, it's it's a toss up between people saying we're going to do free and people saying they're not sure. 
Uh, so that's that's good. Uh, it's good to see that. It looks like we got 47 people saying they would do essentials and 43 people saying they would do not sure and 22 saying they would do advanced. So uh, that's good. That's interesting information. Uh, so let's let's move on from here. All right, so let's go over the VSM deployment scenarios. So we're going to go over deployment scenarios for ESXi and for Hyper-V. Uh, we do support the VSM with its network connections on the VEM. That's supported both for Hyper-V and for ESXi. Uh, we also support the VSM's network connections on a hypervisor native, logical, or distributed switch. You can, you can put the VSM anywhere. We really don't care. Uh, support for the VSM on any supported hypervisor. That just means you can put the VSM on a Hyper-V host or on an ESXi host. We don't care. Uh, you can keep, the, keep make sure you keep the VSMs on different hypervisor hosts. Uh, there's a primary and there's a secondary VSM, and you really want to make sure they're never on the same host at the same time, so use anti-infinity rules to keep them on separate hosts. And then when it comes to cluster-based storage, we don't care. It, it, you know, whatever you're using in your hypervisor environment works fine. It can be fiber channel, iSCSI, NFS, or SIFS. Uh, we really don't have a preference or a specific uh, need for it to be on any type of storage over another. So here are some example deployment scenarios. Uh, we've got some, you know, three common deployment scenarios most customers usually ask about. Uh, the one on the left, we actually have the VSMs running on top of the VEMs that it's managing. This is what we recommend for ESX. Uh, we QA this. We're very confident in this config. Uh, so we recommend this one for customers that want to do that. Uh, you can also put the VSMs network connections on a vSwitch, and that's fine as well, too. We just need network connectivity, so it's not a big deal. Uh, the one in the middle is the one that we would suggest for Hyper-V deployments today. Uh, so if you're looking to deploy Hyper-V, our recommended config would be the config in the middle. Uh, and then a lot of times customers have a separate management cluster, and there's no requirement that the VSM actually be on the hypervisor host that it's managing. Just as long as it has network connectivity to those hypervisors is all that's required. Uh, so you can have the VSM just on a host uh, in a totally different cluster. Now, we also support a stretch model, and this is something a lot of customers have asked for, the ability to have uh, hypervisors spread across different DCs over either dark fiber or some kind of low latency link uh, and have one VSM in one data center and another VSM in another data center. And in the case that if you know one data center totally goes offline, you've got your other half of your hosts in the other data center and the VSM is there. Well, we support this now with version 2.1 and going onward. Uh, there's a few little things you have to be aware of. First, uh, we do require layer 2 connectivity between the two VSMs. So that is a requirement. And then we also need about 10 milliseconds of latency. So it needs to be a low latency link. Now with the Hyper-V current release, we're not supporting this. This will be supported in a later release. So if you're looking to do Hyper-V today and you want to do stretch model, uh, we, we're just not supporting that yet with the first release. Now you can also put the VSM on a Nexus 1110 or 1010 appliance. And that's just a hardware appliance that Cisco sells uh, it's meant for the network team to own the virtualization platform. We heard from a lot of customers that you know, they, what they wanted was they wanted to own the virtualization platform where the VSM is running. And the VSM still runs as a VM on the Nexus 1110. Uh, depending on which one you have, there's a, there's a, you, know, you can have either six or ten VSMs per appliance. Uh, you should always put the appliances in the aggregation layer. It's the best place to put them. Uh, and we also support a stretched model with the appliances as well. So you can have one appliance in one data center and another appliance in another data center, but you still have all the same restrictions. So layer two connectivity needs to be uh, between those two data centers, and then the latency still needs to be 10 milliseconds. And again, Hyper-V is still just not supported in this mode yet. Now, the VSM has two different control modes. So what the control modes are for, let's go back to really the design of the Nexus 1000V. So the Nexus 1000V is based off a hyper uh, or based off a, a chassis-based switch. And a chassis-based switch has uh, a chassis with a backplane, supervisor modules, and line cards. The supervisor modules program and manage the line cards by talking to them over the backplane. Well, in our world, the backplane is the network. So, uh, we, need, we have different control modes in how this, this back, virtual backplane can be configured. Those two modes are layer three mode and layer two mode. Now, we recommend layer three mode today. We used to recommend layer two, but since I think the 1.4, 1.5 timeframe, we're starting to recommend layer three. 
Uh, and this is the default mode now, and we recommend this because it's easier to troubleshoot and it's also more flexible. With Layer 3 control, your ESX hosts can be in different subnets and be spread across your data center, and there's no requirement to just have a, a Layer 2 network uh, globally across your data center. Uh, now, Layer 2 is not going away. It'll still be around. Any customer that still wants to deploy Layer 2, you can. Uh, if you want to migrate from Layer 2 to Layer 3, you can do that as well. Uh, and for folks who are doing Layer 3 mode, uh, Layer 3 is done over UDP, and we use uh, port 4785 for source and destination. So we're going to concentrate on Layer 3 configuration and planning. Uh, we have two options for Layer 3 control. The first is Management Zero, which is the default, and the second is the Control Zero interface, which is a, an optional interface that you can use. Uh, we recommend that you use Management Zero. It's just easier. It's, you know, we can handle all the control traffic over Management Zero. That's fine. If you want to use Control Zero, if you want to separate your control and management traffic, or you want to create a special network, or you're doing something like a DMZ type config, you can use Control Zero, that's fine, it works great. Just be aware that management and control use different VRFs. Uh, so if you decide to use the Control Zero, you'll need to configure the default VRF. Uh, management Zero uses the Management DRF by, uh, by default. Also remember that even though we're doing Layer 3 control between the VSM and the VEMS, the heartbeat mechanisms between the primary and secondary VSM are always Layer 2. That's why we need Layer 2 connectivity uh, in a stretched model config. Now, when it comes to installing the VSM, you have a couple options. Uh, if it's a greenfield environment, we'd recommend using our installer application. And we have an installer application for ESX and one for Hyper-V, and they work very similar. They work best in a greenfield environment, if it's a brand new install or if you're doing something in a lab. If you already have a config and you're trying to add the Nexus 1000V to uh, you know, a, a setup that's already been uh, planted and running, it'd probably be best to use either the ISO or OV, OVA method for ESXi, and on Hyper-V, we have a template or an ISO install method. And they're very simple. It's not too hard to go through. Uh, and we do have directions uh, in the documentation. Now, the installer apps uh, have a neat little feature. They allow you to configure them through the installer app and then save all your inputs to a config file. So if you want to go back later uh, and duplicate what you did, you can simply import that config file. And you don't have to type everything in again. Now, the VSMs do need to connect to VMware vCenter and Microsoft's Hyper-V. Uh, so we're going to concentrate on VMware vCenter right now just for a little troubleshooting and for some uh, configuration information. Uh, now, the VSM connects to VMware's vCenter, and we do this over an SSL connection. And we exchange keys with vCenter using a plugin that contains our SSL cert. Uh, you download the plugin from the VSM, and you load it as a plugin in vCenter, and that gives vCenter our key, and they know how to talk to us that way. Uh, every VSM gets a unique extension ID, so vCenter knows which one it's talking to. Now, we talk to vCenter using vCenter's API, and this is a push and a pull. We'll actually uh, push data up to vCenter, and vCenter can actually push some information back down to us. Uh, VSMs get tied to a VMware data center. You can have multiple VSMs tied to the same data center, uh, and you can have any number of clusters underneath that data center. We don't care. You can even rename the clusters. VSMs are just tied to data centers. That's, the, that's our only requirement. Now, a common issue we see with VSM on ESX uh, when trying to connect to vCenter, you may get an extension key was not registered before its use error. This usually means you just forgot to download the plugin and to register it, just re-download it and re-register. Re and then another common error is you may get connection refused. And this is one of two things. Uh, either you have a firewall in the way that's preventing us from talking to vCenter, or the default API communication port, which is port 80, uh, has been changed on VMware vCenter. And this is kind of common in the VMware world. Uh, customers will sometimes change the, uh, change the port from port 80 to a different port. Uh, there's also a misconception that even though we're doing SSL, that all communication is through port 443, but it's not. Uh, the default API port for VMware vCenter in, is port 80, and it is secure. So that's another question that comes up. Well, if I'm talking to port 80, it's not secure. Uh, it is actually encrypted, so uh, uh, don't worry if you see traffic on port 80. Now, when it comes to Hyper-V, it's a little bit different. Uh, so we still have this idea of, a, of exchanging keys 
but now it's done through what we call a provider extension. And this is really easy. It's just a simple Windows installer file. You double click and we load the extension into the SCVMM host. Uh, now the way the communication between the VSM and SCVMM works is completely different from the way it works with VMware and vCenter. Uh, on the SCVMM side, the API is all on the VSM. So SCVMM pulls data from us. We're not allowed to push data into SCVMM. Uh, now there's some issues here that you need to be aware of. Uh, for example, uh, right now SCVMM only refreshes once every 30 minutes. So if you make a change on the VSM, it may take 30 minutes for it to show up uh, in the SC SCVMM config. Uh, so all you have to do is do a manual refresh on SCVMM and that'll actually uh, force the refresh. We're working with Microsoft to try and improve this timer so it's a little bit more often. Now VSMs and SCVMM get connected to a host group and they can be connected to multiple host groups at the same time and multiple VSMs can be tied to the same host group at the same time as well. Uh, so it's a little less restrictive with SCVMM than it is with VMware. Uh, so you can actually have a VSM be connected to pretty much everything inside your config. Now when it comes to connectivity errors and issues with uh, the, the VSM and SCVMM on Hyper-V, uh, keep in mind there's no persistent connection between the VSM and SCVMM. So on the ESX side there's a persistent connection. You can always see if that connection is up. On uh, SCVMM, we just don't have that. It's a pull, and only SCVMM pulls that information. Uh, so what you want to do is you want to look in the job screen on SCVMM and see if you see any errors for them trying to connect to the VSM. Uh, you can also try a manual refresh and then look in the job screen and see that if it's working. Uh, if it's not working, some things you want to check are basically connectivity from SCVMM to the VSM. Uh, we have a RESTful API, so you should be able to uh, bring up Internet Explorer on the SCVMM host and query our API through a web browser and, and see if that's working. Uh, also check for any proxies or firewalls. Uh, a lot of times when, when customers have had problems, it's usually been a proxy issue or a firewall issue. Uh, and then if you run into an issue where the extension doesn't show up, uh, in SCVMM, just try reinstalling the provider. It's really nothing more than a Windows install. Uh, you simply double click, it installs, and you can also go into control panel and uninstall it and reinstall it. So some Hyper-V specific gotchas for customers that are thinking about Hyper-V. First, uh, know that the VSM for Hyper-V requires a little bit more memory. Uh, it requires two gig on ESX, but because of the move to Nexus OS 5 code for Hyper-V, uh, it's going to require a little bit more RAM. So it goes from 2 gig to 4 gig. Uh, also remember, there's no stretch deployment support for Hyper-V with uh, the first release. Uh, we do recommend that the VSM's network connectivity be on the Microsoft native vSwitch. We would also recommend that the management interface for the uh, Hyper-V host stay uh, dedicated to a NIC or to a Microsoft switch. Not, do not connect the management NIC today to a VEM module. Uh, Hyper-V is uh, limited to 64 VEMs and 2000 VE ports. And then another little issue, the domain IDs are going to shrink from 4000 to 1000 uh, with the Hyper-V code. And again, that's a Nexus OS 5 issue. Uh, I don't think we have anyone running 4000 VSMs yet, so I don't think that's a problem. Uh, but just know that uh, the number is shrinking. And then we only support L3 control with Hyper-V. Uh, so there's no way to do Layer 2 control with Hyper-V. But as we'll see in the next section, setting up Layer 3 control for Hyper-V is a lot easier than for ESX. So best practices for the VSM. L3 control method is preferred. Use your management interface for your control interface. Keep your primary and standby VSMs in the same Layer 2 domain. Uh, even if they're split between data centers, remember the HA between the VSMs is always layer 2. Uh, VSM on the VEM is supported. Uh, the latency between the primary and secondary VSM should be 10 milliseconds. Again, even if it's split data center, 10 milliseconds. Uh, the VSM to VEM latency should be between 5 and 10 milliseconds. Uh, unless you're doing VEMs at a branch office, in which case 100 milliseconds is acceptable. Uh, and then remember to back up your VSM. We support a clone option to back up the VSMs on both ESX and Hyper-V. And a clone takes all of like two minutes. And it's a very easy way to, to back up your VSM uh, before you make any major changes or if before you make an upgrade. Uh, definitely use that option. It's very quick and easy. And if you run into a problem, 
you just power off the you know the the one that's giving you an issue and power on the clone and and you're right back to where you started, which is really good. All right, so that's the VSM section. Uh, why don't we uh, take a second, see if we've got any questions or anything we need to answer, and I can drink a little bit of coffee, uh, and we'll give everyone a second, and we'll see what's going on. Do we have any questions? I take that as a no. So uh, we'll go ahead and we'll move on. So let's go over the virtual Ethernet module. So the virtual Ethernet module, remember, is our data plane. It's the uh, virtual line card. Uh, again, we recommend layer 3 control here. Uh, layer 3 control, when it comes to VMware, requires that a VM kernel NIC be connected to the actual VEM module. So we need this layer 3 interface to forward our control traffic through. Uh, we recommend using uh, ESXi management VM kernel NIC to be this NIC. Uh, so that's what we would recommend. Uh, so we would require that you migrate that NIC to the VEM module. Uh, the reason why we require this, or we don't require this, we recommend this, is that it doesn't require static routes. And I'll give you an example here in a second of, of where you run into issues. Uh, now, don't create a Layer 3 VM kernel NIC on the same subnet as the management VM kernel NIC. And I'm going to give you an example here in a second. So here's what we don't want you to do. Here we have an example. I have uh, an ESX host. I have VMK0, which is generally your management interface. It's on 192.168.10, and it's connected to the vSwitch. I have another VM kernel interface, VM kernel 1, and it's on 192.168.10, but it's connected to the VEM module. Now the problem here is that VMware uses a single TCP IP stack for all its VM kernel interfaces. They have no way to direct traffic up a particular interface when they share the same subnet. So what will happen is that the traffic for VM kernel 1, rather than traveling up through the VEM, through the NIC assigned to the VEM, it will actually go through the vSwitch and up the NIC that's connected to the vSwitch. So this is an issue. You really do not want to do this if you want to, if you, if you need to. This is why we recommend taking VM kernel 0 and just migrating it over to the VEM. Uh, the other option, obviously, is to get give VMK1 on a different subnet, and in a later slide, we'll show where that can be an issue as well. So the easiest thing to do is just to take VM kernel 0 and move it over to the VEM. Now, when it comes to installing the VEM, uh, you have a couple options. In the ESX world, you have something called VUM, which is VMware Update Manager. When VUM works, VUM's great. It does everything for you. It copies the VEM down, installs it, gets everything up and running. Uh, it does require that the HTTP server on the VSM be up and running. Uh, sometimes we would, you do run into issues with VUM, and we would recommend that you turn off the HA, the DRS, and the DPM features of the cluster when you're doing the install. Uh, what I have noticed is that in ESX 5.1, uh, it seems like VUM does that automatically, so you don't have to do that manually anymore. Uh, now, the VUM logs themselves or actually in the, in the directory there on the screen. If you ever run into issues, simply look in that file, take a look at the logs. It's usually very verbose. It'll usually tell you what's going on and what the problem is. Uh, the VEM modules themselves get stored on the VUM server in the directory on the screen. And there's actually two directories. There's a Cisco directory, and that's the, the VEM modules that get pulled from the VSM. And there's the CSCO directory, and those are the VEM modules that get pulled from the VUM portal. Uh, so those get pulled down from, uh, from VMware. Also be aware that when you uninstall VUM, it doesn't always clean out those directories. So if you're trying to clean up and maybe VUM's giving you issues and you think an uninstall will work, uh, make sure you delete those directories after you uninstall VUM and reinstall. Uh, now you can also install manually. Uh, so you can, do man you can manually install the VEM modules just using ESX CLI. Uh, the commands there on the screen, if uh, your ESX host can actually get to the VSM via HTTP, you don't even have to copy the VEM module, you simply just use uh, give it the uh, URL to download and it will actually download and install all in one command. Uh, so that's really useful. And then you can also use the Nexus 1000V installer to install the, the VEM modules. Uh, so you know, this is very handy, There's, it works with, in two ways. Uh, if VUM is installed, we'll try to contact VUM and install the VEM using VUM. Uh, if VUM's not there, there's a HTTP client method that you can use. 
Uh, now, it does need to be enabled on the ESXi host. By default, it's not enabled. Uh, so you'll need to go to the ESXi host and just enable that through the security settings. Uh, and then we can push the uh, VEM module and install it to all the ESXi hosts. Uh, now, keep in mind, this still requires that you have administrator privileges to the ESXi hosts. Uh, and your VSM does need to be connected to vCenter to use this method. So you can't use it to pre-position the VEMs before you actually install the VSM. Now, for customers that are using stateless ESXi, uh, we do support that as well. Uh, what you have to do in this method is essentially slipstream the VEM modules into your, your uh, boot image. Uh, in stateless ESXi, essentially the ESX hosts boot off the network and keep the ESX config in memory. So every time they reboot, they get uh, essentially a clean config. Uh, so all you have to do is just slipstream those modules. Uh, and it's very easy if I can do it. Pretty much anyone can do it. And it's uh, four power CLI commands to do it. It's, it's not very difficult. Uh, and the instructions are in the install and upgrade guide. And we have quite a few number of customers doing this. Now, when it comes to the VEM deployment from Microsoft, it's a little bit, little bit easier. Uh, first, again, only L3 is supported, no Layer 2. But with Microsoft, with Layer 3 mode, there's no special NIC required. We simply just talk to the management NIC of the Windows Server, Windows 2012 server. Uh, now this management NIC, you can assign it to a physical NIC on the Hyper-V host. Microsoft also gives you the ability to create a virtual NIC and then assign that virtual NIC to a Microsoft native or logical switch. We, that works for us as well. The only thing we w wouldn't recommend, again, is taking the management NIC and connecting it to the Nexus 1000V VEM module. The other cool thing with Microsoft is there's no special port profile required on the config side of the Nexus 1000V, uh, and we'll go over that in the troubleshooting section. Uh, but you, you don't have to create any special port profile. We simply just, by default, talk directly to the management NIC. So it's a very easy configuration, much easier to set up and get running than ESX. Now, when it comes to installing the VEM on Microsoft, again, it's, it's pretty easy. Uh, because the VEM is nothing more than a simple Windows installer file. Uh, you simply manually, you would just copy it over to the Windows Server 2012 host and you would double click and it would install and that's it. If you want to remove it, you bring up control panel and just remove the, uh, remove the VEM as a program. Uh, if for, when you're doing it through SCVMM, SCVMM will automatically install the VEM if it's not manually installed. So you don't have to do anything. You also don't need any additional services to do this. Uh, when it comes to upgrades, we're going to try and leverage Windows Server Update services to, to do that. Uh, so for the general install, you don't need anything. Uh, when it comes to upgrades, we're probably going to use uh, the update services from Windows to do that. All right, now we're going to get into some troubleshooting of the VEM for Layer 3. And we're going to concentrate on ESXi. And we're going to address the issue when the VM kernel interface is actually on a different subnet uh, than VM kernel 1 is on a different subnet subnet than VM kernel 0. So what we have here is sample topology and this would what I would consider a worst case scenario. Uh, so we have the VSMs at the bottom left. They are uh, management interface is 192.168.151 and then your control interface is what we're going to use for the control traffic. It's on 192.168.11.10 and then we have two ESX hosts. And those ESX hosts have a VM kernel interface for management, which is VM kernel 0, and a VM kernel interface for the VSM control, which is VM kernel 1. We're only going to migrate VM kernel 1 for that control traffic. Uh, and we're going to show you some of the issues you may run into when the VM kernel interfaces are on different subnets than the actual control interface. So for ESXi host 1, you can see that VMK1 is actually on 192.168.10 which is different than control 0, which is on 192.168.11. And ESXi host 2 is actually on the same subnet as the control, so it's 192.168.11. So the first thing that needs to happen in this config on ESX is that the customer needs to create a VM kernel interface on the ESXi hosts to be used. Now the VMware admin does this. As a network admin, unless he's given you administrator rights, you can't do this. He needs to do it. Uh, so what you want to do is you want to make sure he configured it correctly. First, uh, look at the IP address, make sure it's correct, check the net mask, uh, check the broadcast. You know, may want to record what the MAC address is in case you need to do some troubleshooting layer, later. Next, you want to verify connectivity. Obviously, from the ESXi host, see if you can ping that control zero interface on the VSM. 
Once you do that, we may have to do a static route requirement. So remember that in our example, we had uh, host one was in a different subnet than the actual control interface. It was in 192.168.10. It needs to be able to talk to 192.168.11. Well, in ESX world, you can only have one default router, and they don't have a concept of VRFs. So you, you need to create a static route so that the ESX host knows how to get to 192.168.11 through the 192.168.10 interface. So this obviously can be tedious, and it has to be done manually. Uh, again, and this is why we recommend you simply take the VM kernel 0 interface, which is the management interface, and just port it to the VM. Uh, you don't have to worry about having multiple VM kernel interfaces on the same subnet issue, and you also don't have to create any static routes. So that was, that's the reasons why we recommend that. Uh, if you need to create the static route, it's pretty simple. It's just like with Linux. You just do a route add, uh, give, it the, give it the network, the netmask, and the gateway. Now on the VSM side for Layer 3, uh, you want to check your SVS domain parameters. You want to make sure you're in Layer 3 mode. Make sure you're using the right Layer 3 interface. In this case, it's Control 0. Then you want to verify Control 0 is actually using the right IP address and subnet mask. Ver remember, Control 0 and Management 0 use uh, different uh, VRFs, so you may need to configure the default VRF if you're using Control 0. Uh, and then check, the ping check that you can ping. So from the VSM, see if you can ping the ESXi interfaces through the default VRF. Uh, next, you need to check the uplink port profile. So we have uh, the ESX hosts are both on 196, 192, 168, 10, and 11. So we need to make sure, and those are VLANs 10 and 11 in, in my config. So we need to make sure that VLANs 10 and 11 are allowed and that VLANs 10 and 11 are actually configured as system VLANs. And this is a, an important concept in the Nexus 1000V world. Next, we need a special VE port profile to assign those VMK1 interfaces to. And this is just in the ESX world where this has to happen. This special port profile needs to have capability L3 control. Uh, if it doesn't have that, the VEM doesn't know that it's supposed to forward its control traffic through that interface. We also need to make sure it's on the right VLAN and that it has a system VLAN set as well. Now, since the ESX hosts are on different VLANs, we actually really need to have two of these port profiles one for VLAN 10 and one for VLAN 11. Another important point about uh, port profiles that have capability L3 control in them is that you cannot assign virtual machines to this port profile. Only VM kernel NICs can be assigned to this port profile. So if later on you have VMs that are also on VLAN 11 and you're thinking you'll just assign those, VLANs, uh, those VMs here instead of creating another port profile, the VSM actually won't let you do it and it'll actually refuse the, uh, the config. Now, when it comes to troubleshooting the VEM on Hyper-V, man, it's a lot easier. It's, uh, it's, it's Because the config is so much easier, troubleshooting is a lot easier. Uh, basically, you just want to verify that the SCVMM can talk to VSM. So you want to verify your API reachability and, again, check for any proxies or firewalls. Uh, one thing on the Hyper-V world is SCVMM keeps a logical switch compliance. And this just means that the config that SCVMM is storing needs to be the same that's on the VSM and the same that's on the VEM. If you look at the logical switch compliance and it's not compliant, there's a remediate button. And when you click that remediate button, uh, SCVMM will go out and make sure everything is set back to the way it needs to be. So that's something to look for on Hyper-V. Uh, and then if you're running into issues with the VEM, it's a service on the Windows server. Uh, all you need to do is go into services, find the Nexus 1000V proce process, right click on it and say restart. And uh, that will restart the process. Now when it comes to VEM best practices, you have a couple, uh, again, use L3 control, don't use L2. Uh, use your ESXi management interface as the control interface because of the two reasons we came up with earlier. Um, multiple VM kernel interfaces on the same subnet doesn't behave like most people expect. And if you create uh, a different VM kernel interface on a different subnet, uh, you may have to do a static route. So keep that in mind as well. Make sure your control networks have low latency and available bandwidth. Latency is more important to us than bandwidth. 
So 10 milliseconds for your local data center connection and 100 milliseconds if your VEMs are at a branch office. Uh, if you're using Cisco UCS, know that VMFX, and we do support VMFX on both ESX and Hyper-V, and the Nexus 1000V are mutually exclusive. You can't do uh, you can't do VMFX and, v and Nexus 1000V on the same hypervisor at the same time. Uh, so that means if you create a service profile with a dynamic VNIC in it, the Nexus 1000V VEM will not load correctly. So uh, never create any dynamic VNICs uh, in your service profile if you're going to do uh, Nexus 1000V. Okay, so the next section is upgrades. And uh, we get a lot of questions about upgrades, so we decided uh, decided we would add some some slides on upgrades. So first, with upgrades, obviously the the, the most important is just to read and follow the upgrade guides, and, and to follow the guides based off the version that you're actually starting from and going to. Uh, the upgrades are not the same from one version to the next. They're pretty consistent once you get to about 1.4 and 1.5, but if you're on an older version like 1.3. Uh, the upgrades are going to be a little bit different. So always read the upgrade guides. And if it's not clear, uh, post a question in support forms or open a TAC case, either one. Second, always take a backup of your VSMs before you do an upgrade. Uh, again, if your VSMs are running on an ESXi or Hyper-V host, you can just clone them. I mean, that's just the easiest way to take a backup. It, it it's, takes all of about two minutes, uh, and you have an exact copy of your VSM before you do the upgrade. If you're using a Nexus 1010 or 1110, we have an export function that works similar to a clone, uh, but a little bit different, but it, it's a good way too as, to take a backup of the VSM. And it, again, only takes a few minutes to do it. And then also make sure to back up your running config. You know, it always helps to have that running config in a text file somewhere so that you can actually look at it. Also, we'd really recommend you generate a text support before the upgrade. That way, if you do run into issues later, uh, we can look at the tech support before the upgrade and determine what was running and what if there were any issues uh, to see if that would impact anything that you may have run into during the upgrade. If something does go wrong, stop, call TAC, open a case, or you know post something on support forms. Uh, don't continue with the upgrade if something doesn't look right or you're running into issues. Uh, and remember to use a maintenance window. This is uh, this this is a you know an upgrade you are it is kind of an online upgrade you never really will have an outage window or an outage but again you're doing something pretty pretty big so take a maintenance window so here's a quick table that shows you our supported upgrades uh, I started with 1.3 hopefully nobody is still running 1.2 uh, but we still see some folks running 1.3 and this shows you uh, you know where you can go and where you can where starting from and where you can go uh, and whether or not we support combined VMware upgrades and we'll talk about that on the next slide uh, so we do support going from 1.3 to 2.1 although you have to first go to 1.4 uh, and then from 1.4 to 2.1 and 1.5 to 2.1 and then uh, version 1.4 was the last version to support ESX 4.0. And, and we do have an upgrade matrix tool, and I'd highly suggest you use that. Uh, it's just a, a web-based tool. You plug in the code you're at and the code you want to go to, uh, and it tells you what your options are. Now, when it comes to comp combined upgrades, this is new for us. Uh, previously, we really didn't support the ability to upgrade both the Nexus 1000V and the version of VMware ESX at the same time. Uh, you had to first upgrade the Nexus 1000V, and then you could upgrade ESX. Well, as of 1.52 and vCenter 5.0 update 1, you can do both at the same time now. Uh, now, the steps are pretty easy. You simply upgrade the VSM first, then you create an ISO, uh, an upgrade ISO image that includes the new VEM module, and then you simply just go through the upgrade uh, as you would for an ESX host. Uh, and that's it, and it makes it a lot easier. Previously, you would first have to upgrade the VSM and the VEMS, and then you would be able to upgrade the uh, ESX hosts. Now, when it comes to upgrading the VSM, you should really be aware that we made a lot of changes in 2.1, and those changes are for the better. Uh, what we allow you to do now is that you can actually upgrade the VSM and make changes to the running config without having to upgrade the VEMS. If you're on the 1.x code train, we really don't support the ability for you to make changes to the running config if you've upgraded the VSMs but not upgraded the VEMPs. Uh, 
Uh, and we know this was an issue because, you, you know, you could have up to 64 ESX hosts connected to the Nexus 1000V. You may not be able to take an outage window to upgrade all those hosts at the same time. Uh, and for some customers, it would take them quite a bit of time to get all their hosts uh, up to the same uh, Nexus 1000V version. So this is a huge, uh, a huge plus for the Nexus 1000V. Now, the upgrade for the VSM is very similar to the way you would upgrade any Cisco Nexus switch. Uh, you would copy the Kickstart and system images, the new ones, up to the Nexus 1000V's VSM. And then you just run install all. And install all will essentially upgrade and reboot the uh, secondary VSM. It'll do a system switch over and then upgrade the old primary uh, to the new code and then at attach it as a secondary uh, to, the to the old secondary, which is now primary. Now, obviously, this requires no outage of the VSM. One VSM is always up and running. But again, I would use a maintenance window uh, while you're doing the upgrade. Now, if you run into an issue of the upgrade of the VSM, um, first, stop and assess the situation. Uh, you know, if, if one... If, the, if you do the upgrade and, and, and the VSMs are not coming back online, you know, don't, don't continue. Try and figure out what's going on. Uh, you know, if you're uncomfortable, call TAC, open a TAC case. Uh, hopefully you took a backup. So a worst case scenario, you can simply turn off the VSMs that failed the upgrade and power on the clones that you took earlier. Uh, sometimes what happens is during the upgrade of the VSM, the VEMs will not connect to the standby VSM once it's switched over to primary. Uh, this usually happens when customers have never tested the network connectivity between the secondary VSMs and the VEMs. And it's usually a network problem between that secondary VSM and the VEMs. They just can't communicate. So if you do the upgrade and none of your VEMs show up, uh, try a system switchover so that the system switches back to the old primary VSM, and, and that'll usually reestablish the network connection and fix the, fix the VEM connectivity. Uh, you may actually want to test your standby VSM before the upgrade. You may want to try a system switchover just to make sure that your, your standby VSM can indeed talk to the VEM modules, especially if you've never done one before. Obviously, do a maintenance window when you do this because your VEMs could lose connectivity. Uh, now, when it comes to upgrading the VEMs, you have a couple of uh, couple of ways for this to happen. And this is all ESX because we really don't have a, a new version for Hyper-V yet. Uh, first, the VEM module upgrade always gets, gets kicked off from the virtual supervisor module. You don't want to try and upgrade the VEM modules uh, from VMware vCenter. Uh, if VUM is installed, we'll communicate with VUM, and VUM will automatically go and do everything for you. Uh, we will manage the upgrade from the VSM by communicating to VUM. We'll put a host in maintenance mode. VUM will, downgrade, will uh, download and install the new VEM module, take the host out of maintenance mode, uh, and then move on to the next host. And it just does that in a serial fashion until it's gone through all the hosts. If VUM is not installed, it's the same process. You just do it manually. Uh, so you still kick off the process from the VSM, but then you manually go to the ESX host, put them in maintenance mode, upgrade the VEM, and then take them out of maintenance mode. Uh, now, always make sure to upgrade uh, to complete the upgrade. Uh, so there's a, a command once you're done. It's called VMware VEM Upgrade Complete. Uh, if you don't run that command, if you add any new ESX host to the Nexus 1000V, vCenter will actually push the old VEM module down and not the new VEM module. So you always want to run that command after you complete the upgrade. Now, some, some issues you may run into when, you, when you're uh, upgrading the VEM and how to troubleshoot. Remember that the VMware admin always has to acknowledge the upgrade in vCenter. So when the first command you kick off from the VSM actually puts a little pop-up in vCenter, and the VMware admin has to accept that. And you're not allowed to continue with the upgrade until the VMware admin has actually uh, clicked that little button and said, yeah, I know you want to do an upgrade. Uh, never upgrade the VEMs by pushing a VUM baseline. The VEM should always be upgraded by the VSM. Uh, and we've seen issues where customers try to upgrade the VEMs by using VUM to, to do that. Uh, make sure you have DRS capacity. Uh, so you want to make sure you have the capacity to actually take an ESX host and put it in maintenance mode. If you don't have that capacity, the host will never go into maintenance mode and the upgrade will never complete. Uh, if a particular ESXi host fails, during the upgrade, it's usually because it won't go into maintenance mode. 
So what you want to do is to go into vCenter and start troubleshooting why that host won't go into maintenance mode. It could, could be a number of reasons. It could be that a VM is tied specifically to that ESXi host. Uh, you may have to just remove that rule. Uh, or you know, it could be any of a number of issues. But you want to figure out why the host won't go into maintenance mode. Once you figure that out, go back to the VSM and kick the upgrade back off again, and you can do that. We won't try and upgrade the hosts that have already been upgraded. We'll start with the last host and where we failed. And then we'll upgrade that host, and then we'll continue to do the upgrade. And if we run into another host and it has another problem, we'll stop. And you do the same thing over again. You just troubleshoot why that host won't go into maintenance mode, why it won't do the upgrade, fix it, and then kick the upgrade off again, and it'll continue. All right, so that's, that's upgrades. That's it. Um, Time-wise... Um, I think I'm, I'm very close to my time. I was told to leave a little time, a little bit of uh, extra for answering questions. We do have an appendix section on the Cisco Nexus 1010 and 1110. It'll be in the slides, but uh, I'm not going to cover it uh, uh, verbally right now in this session. This session. So I think we're ready for questions. Okay. Um. We have a couple questions from attendees. Um, can you explain the numbers and letters in the NSOX, uh, NXOS code for Nexus 1000V? Sure. Let's, uh, can I go back to the top slide? Let me see. Do I, let's, thank you. And let me go back. Okay. Okay, so here. Uh, so the versions, the uh, versions on the left where it says 521, parentheses 1, SM1, 5.1, those, re, uh, those are really correlate more to the NXOS version of the Nexus 1000V that the code is based on. Nexus 1000V runs off Nexus OS code like the Nexus 5K, Nexus 7K, uh, Nexus 6K. Uh, and that's the code base that the Nexus 1000V is built off. The last two numbers, or the, the, the S M1 and then the parentheses 51 is the Nexus 1000V specific version. So uh, SM151 relates to Hyper-V. SV2 parentheses 1.1 is version 2.1 for ESX, and SV1 uh, 5.x is 1.5x for uh, for ESX. Hopefully that answered the question. Uh, thank you. Uh, and another question here. Uh, so with uh, M1KV support across DCs, will VXLAN be supported across DCs as well? Uh, that's a great question. So um, it, currently today, VXLAN is supported across data centers. So the, uh, the answer is yes. Okay. And will you ever support L3 connectivity for stretch mode in the future? Uh, between the two VSMs, that's a great question. I'm not sure. Uh, we support layer 3 connectivity, obviously, between the VSMs and the VEMs. Uh, but when it comes to layer 3 control be for HA between the primary and secondary VSM, I I'm not sure if we're planning to actually implement that or not. I, I can go back and try and find out. Right now, it's layer 2 and layer 2 okay. only. Okay. And N1KV doesn't use VN tag technology as a... Uh, a FEX does. Is that correct? That is correct. There's a, early on, there's a lot of misconception that the Nexus 1000V ran VN tagging, and it does not. Uh, it, it is not a VN. It does not use VN tag like UCS does. And can we use Nexus Essentials as a training tool for Nexus for free and ongoing training? Yeah, that's fine. That's, I mean, it's free. <laughs> sure. That's exactly what it's for. And the, the other thing with the licensing, the um, if you want to try out the advanced version, you can enable the advanced version on the VSM. And, and the other thing, too, is the VSM can run essentials or advanced. There's, no, there's nothing specific that you have to have a VSM that's advanced specific or essentials specific. You can enable the advanced version, and I think you get a 60-day grace period. So you can enable advanced, play with it, see if you need it, and then if you don't need it, you can simply uh, convert the VSM back to essentials, and that's it. Okay. 
And is my understanding that NX1000V is unable to work standalone? It requires the VSM, and the VSM will require the vCenter or the SCVMM. Is this correct? or, an, or That is correct. That is, that is correct. We, um, we do require, and a lot of this has to do with the infrastructure that the hypervisor vendors have provided us. Uh, so we need to work within the infrastructure that they give us, and in a lot of cases, uh, that's dictate. The reason w the way it works today is mostly because it's dictated to us by VMware and Microsoft. And what happens if the VSM dash VSM latency latency spikes above 10 M's? Um, if it's very short, hopefully nothing really. Uh, so let's uh, real quick. Let's talk about how uh, VSM HA works. Uh, we broadcast heartbeats between the primary and standby VSM, and that happens over the control zero interface. Uh, we will send uh, a heartbeat every second, and if we miss a heartbeat, uh, if we miss up to three heartbeats, we start to think something's going on, and the VSM goes into what we call degraded mode. Uh, if we miss another three heartbeats, the VSMs will actually drop from each other, uh, and we can we either think one of the VSMs is down or we end up going into some kind of split brain mode. Uh, and then from there, we'll go into a, a split brain recovery once the network connection comes back up. 10 milliseconds is about where we would like it. I mean, if, if, it's, if it spikes for a second or two, it should be okay. Uh, you may see one of the VSMs drop, but uh, it, it should be okay. Just try and keep it low. Another question here, is it recommended to use a V-switch on VMware similar to Hyper-V? No. Uh, when it comes to the Nexus 1000V on uh, VMware, we're perfectly comfortable with the VSM being on the VEM module. Okay. And another question here. Since uh, VSMs are L3, is NetFlow export supported? Yes. That's a good question. And uh, another good question here. Don't you run into issues if vCenter is down when trying to bring everything up if the management interface is on the VEM? No, uh, you don't, uh, mostly because uh, if you do the config correctly, uh, the VEM module w has a little bit of programming in it itself. And what it will do is it will initialize, read that programming, and it will bring those interfaces up and allow them to actually talk to the network even if the VSM or vCenter is down. Uh, so the answer there is no. Okay. And are snapshots supported as a pre-upgrade backup option? You know, uh, that's a great question. And, and the answer is, the, the official answer is no. However, uh, it I find it useful in some cases, especially in lab environments. I will use it. Uh, there's, but you know, when it, since it's not officially supported, and since a clone takes only maybe a, another minute or two over a, a snapshot, a clone is what we support. But um, in some cases, like I said, in a lab environment, a snapshot's perfectly fine. And another question here: How Nexus 1000 differs from Nexus 7000? Uh, that's that's a good question. Uh, the Nexus 7000 obviously is a hardware-based switch, and the Nexus 1000V is virtually a uh, virtual-based switch. Uh, obviously, Nexus 1000V being a virtual-based switch, we only work with ESX and Hyper-V hypervisors. Uh, Nexus 7000 obviously will work with uh, any network device that, that that can plug into it. Okay, and are there any control plane concerns with when generating the tech support during operational hours? Um, there shouldn't be. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, but no, there really shouldn't be. I've not heard of any uh, that I'm aware of. Uh, usually, the VSM usually runs pretty well. It's a pretty efficient uh, piece of code, and uh, it usually runs without any issue as far as it, you know generating a tech support during the middle of the day. And another question here, what are the impacts in migrating the VSM from L2 to L3? That's a good question. Uh, and and uh, we do have a document that goes over how to do that. And uh, I'd highly suggest that you take a look at the document. There is a transition that we, uh, uh, a transition guide, and that transition guide kind of walks through it. Okay. Um, and you can 
continue to submit your questions right now, and we'll still be answering those. So if you have any more questions, go ahead and submit those. Uh, here's another question. Are any other sessions planned to cover Hyper-V in more detail, uh, demoing the install or the config? Uh, we can do that. I don't have anything on, the, uh, on my calendar, but I, I think that would be a great idea. Okay, so you would be willing to do that in a Oh yeah, session. definitely. Yeah, that's that's that'd be fine. It's um it's not that hard of a config. It's a little bit different, especially for customers who maybe uh or ESX customers today and maybe looking at Hyper-V, it would probably be good to see uh the differences between uh Nexus 1000V and Hyper-V and ESX so that they're a little bit aware of uh you know what it would take to get Nexus 1000V and a Hyper-V environment stood up and running. And uh Use case of N1K over VMware DBS. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, when it comes to feature wise, we're we're pretty much feature wise about the same. Um, where you get into uh, where we add extra value is that uh, we are real. Like I said, and you saw it in the features, we are trying to be multi hypervisor, multi cloud. Uh, and then we have a lot of add-on services using VPath. So today with Nexus 1000V, uh, you can use the Virtual Security Gateway for tenant uh, security. You have the ASA 1000V that, that can use VPath, so that gives you a full firewall functionality, uh, as well as a VXLAN gateway. Uh, we also have the cloud services router, which will give you layer three uh, in the hypervisor environment. And we're working with Citrix and Imperva uh, and we're also coming out with our own VXLAN gateway as well as the Nexus 1000V uh, intercloud product, which will allow you to take VMs from your private cloud and actually migrate them into, for example, an Amazon uh, web services uh, environment. So uh, we're a little, like I said, we're more multi, multi hypervisor, multi cloud uh, is where we're going. Obviously, with the VMware virtual switch, feature by feature, they're fine. But in a broader perspective, uh, we're we're trying to go a little bit beyond that. And the next question: uh, Where the VXLAN gateway functionality resides at the VEM or at the VSM or at the Nexus one one ten? There. Okay, that's a great question. And uh, today, with the VXLAN gateway, the plan today when it ships is that it'll first only be supported on the Nexus uh, 1110 uh, hardware-based appliance. Uh, the VXLAN gateway, because of the way it, it's uh, meant to work, requires a little bit more underlying hardware, a little bit more dedicated hardware to actually perform well. So for the first release, it will actually be a virtual machine uh, on the Nexus 1110 appliance. And then uh, the plan is to make it available as a VM in which you can actually run uh, on ESXi or Hyper-V. And are there any issues or concerns using OTV as the layer two overlay to deploy VSM HA? No, in fact, we would recommend it. And uh, Nexus 1010 and Nexus uh, 1110 use EXI or Hyper-V? Yes, uh, again, we when it comes to the VSM virtual machines, we don't care where you put them. They're virtual machines as long as they're on a supported hypervisor platform, which would be the Nexus uh, 1110 or 1010, ESX or Hyper-V. Now, the Nexus 1110 and 1010 do not run ESX or Hyper-V. They actually run Nexus OS, uh, and the VSM runs as a virtual machine on top of Nexus OS. And can you elaborate further on specific functions of the three VLANs between VSM and VEM, management, control, and packet? Right. So there's a common misconception that they need to be different VLANs, and they don't. They're just three different interfaces. Uh, initially, when we created it, we thought it would be best for, the, for them to be on different VLANs to segregate the traffic. But as we uh, customers started deploying the product and we became more comfortable with it, now we're perfectly fine with control, management, and packet all being on the same VLAN. We're perfectly fine with that. Uh, now, the control interface on the VSM is used for control traffic. Uh, in which case uh, we pass heartbeats between the primary and secondary VSM using that interface. And if in, you're in layer two control mode, it's also the interface we use to send heartbeats to the VEM modules. 
The management interface is the second interface, and that's the interface you use to connect to the VSM uh, via CLI or SNMP or if you're using some ma other management application. Uh, it, it's just used for that connectivity unless you do layer 3 control. If you do layer 3 control, it becomes the default control interface be, for the heartbeats between the VSM and the VEM. The packet interface is, only, is the third interface and is only used in layer 2 mode. Uh, we use the packet interface to pass IGMP and CDP information from the VEM modules to the VSM. When you're in layer 3 mode, the, everything that would go over the packet interface is encapsulated and, and goes directly to either management zero or control zero. Now, even though in some modes those interfaces aren't used, you always need to make sure those interfaces are present on the VSM virtual machine. Uh, it looks for those interfaces, and if it's not there, it won't initialize correctly. So always create them even if you're, we're not using them based off the, layer, the, the control mode we're using. That's a great question. Okay, and does VEM to VEM traffic have to pass through an external switch? There is, yes. Uh, actually, the VEMs do not talk directly to each other. Uh, if uh, a VEM sees a, sees a packet, and if it's not destined for any of the VMs that, it's currently con that are currently connected to that VEM, uh, it will forward that traffic up to the upstream switch and let the upstream switch deal with it. And is it recommended to update the VEM manually without a VUM if you want to control when the host goes into maintenance mode one after another? Not yes. Yeah, that's a great question. And if you want to control when the ESX host and which ESX host goes into maintenance mode, I would definitely do it manually, yes. That's a great question, too. Okay, we're having a lot of great questions, so continue to submit them, and we'll uh, continue to answer them for a little while longer. So uh, the next question, where the VXLAN gateway functionality resides, at the VEM or at the VSM or at the Nexus 1110? Uh, I think we already had that question, but it, it's going to reside on the Nexus 1110. Okay. Yes, I think we did cover that a little bit earlier. Um, how can we perform a full-level application backup, CLI, and show run for the switch part and for the vCenter part? That's a good question, um, and that's a little bit more involved. Uh, so that would require the uh, you know some coordination between the network admin and the VMware admin. Uh, and it's going to also depend, obviously, on, your, on how vCenter is architected. Uh, but what you could do, obviously, is since we support a clone of the VSM, and uh, I believe VMware also supports vCenter as a virtual machine today, uh, what you could do is coordinate uh, an outage window, take a clone of the Nexus 1000V, and, take a, and then once you do that, uh, somehow take a clone of the uh, vCenter server as well. And can you integrate or deploy both CSR-1000B and N1K on the same EXI? Yeah. Uh, actually, today, the CSR uh, doesn't, have, uh, doesn't have any requirement to, for the Nexus 1000V. Uh, so the CSR doesn't use VPATH. It doesn't require the Nexus 1000V. You can actually use the CSR with, without Nexus 1000V at all. Okay. And uh, a couple more things. Um, when will Nexus 1000B for ESX and Hyper-V be on the same NXOS code version? I was waiting for that question. Uh, that's a good question, and, and um, I'm not 100% sure would, would be my answer. Uh, most likely that will happen with the next major release of ESX or ESX version for us. Uh, so it won't be the 2.2 release, but it will probably be the next version after that. Uh, Timeline-wise, I'm not exactly sure when that's going to happen, but uh, we're on a release schedule of about one version every six months, give or take. So that gives you kind of an idea. Okay. And will Nexus 1000V on Hyper-V support all the same features as Nexus 1000V on ESX? Uh, that's, again, a good question. And that's going to be depend – where applicable would be my answer. So, for example, if uh, VMware has a feature that Microsoft does not, uh, obviously we can't support that feature. Today, we support just about every feature on Hyper-V that ESX has except for VXLAN and also um, fair-weighted queuing. Uh, we do not support fair-weighted queuing on Hyper-V because uh, Microsoft just doesn't have that architecture built into SCVMM. OK. 
Okay, and that was our next question. A, a person had a question on VX land support on Hyper-V, so I think you just addressed that, um, that it is not supported. Correct, yep. Okay. If I have an advanced license, do I have to use it? No, you don't have to. You don't want to use it, you don't have to. Um, uh, if you have an advanced license, uh, you know, in some cases, if you're not, as long as you're not using those four features that require the advanced license, uh, Cisco TrustSec, uh, Dynamic, uh, ARP inspection, IP source guard, and uh, DHCP snooping, you do not need to use the advanced license. And so, for example, if you have an advanced license and your advanced license only has uh, 10 sockets and you're not using those features uh, and you upgrade to 2.1, you know, you can change from advanced to essentials and go from 10 sockets to 512 sockets. That's perfectly fine. Another question here, can I have more than two VSMs for extra redundancy? No, unfortunately not, no. So what I would, you know, it, it's two VSMs. Uh, they're both active at the same time. Uh, they share, uh, they have a shared IP address. Uh, one's active, the other one's standby, just like a supervisor module in a switch, or modules in a switch, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, if you want to have, if you're worried about the uh, reliability of the VSM, just take a clone, you know, just take clones. If you run into an issue, one of them dies or disappears or your VMware admin accidentally deletes it, you can, you know, you can just promote that clone back to a VM. Okay, and we have time for a couple more questions to address uh, before we close out the session. But uh, does the 1000V for Hyper-V does not have QoS functionality yet? It does have QoS functionality. So we have QoS marking, but we do not have fair-weighted queuing. And is it uh, a pl in the plans to add layer three functionality in N1000B? Uh, we do support layer three between the VSM and the VEMS, but not between the two VSMs. And what is the marketability of Nexus 1110, uh, and can it inoperate in a multi-vendor environment? Well, that's a good question. Uh, so the Nexus uh, 1110, is really just a Cisco appliance, runs Nexus OS code. Uh, so it's basically, you know, the virtual, a virtualization, it's aimed at network admins to own the, a virtualization platform rather than having to have ESX or Hyper-V. Uh, they get a platform that they're familiar with, Nexus OS, uh, and then they can load VSMs, uh, virtual security gateway. Uh, you can also load um, ASA 1000V, I believe, and uh, you'll be able to load the Citrix uh, Netscaler and the Imperver WAF applications all on that appliance, as well as uh, there's a, a NAM appliance that you can load on there as well. So the idea is that the network admin owns the appliance. He doesn't have to have, e have stuff on ESX or have it on Hyper-V. Uh, he manages and owns the appliance, and it works just like a, like he, like a Nexus OS switch. Interoperability-wise, um, you know, there, there's really not much to it more than it's, you know, it's just a virtualization platform. Uh, you can only obviously put uh, appliances that Cisco has certified on there, so you won't be able to, like, download a, a, a virtual machine from the VMware marketplace and put that on a Nexus 1010 or 1110. Uh, so it's only Cisco certified applications, but it, it's, you know, we're trying to make it a little bit broader, we're trying to add a lot more features and functionality. Okay, uh, let's take this uh, last question, and then if any individuals didn't have their questions answered during the Q&A, uh, please note that Lewis is going to be doing an Ask the Expert event after the conclusion of this webcast, so you'll have uh, about 10 days to go up onto the Cisco support community and uh, have your questions answered there. So uh, this last one is FT, uh, let me see. Is FT still supported for the VSMs? No, we do not support fault tolerance uh, for the VSMs. And the reason being is because uh, we've kind of already built in our own HA mechanism to the VSMs. They have the, you know, you have primary and secondary, and there's really no reason to do fault tolerance. It's just kind of an added uh, burden uh, for something that's really not needed. So we, we just don't support it uh, on the VSMs. Now you can have, we do support the Nexus 1000V in a fault tolerant environment, so you can have VMs that are doing FT, but uh, you don't want to, you don't want to do FT with the VSMs. Okay. 
Well, thank you, everybody, for submitting those questions. I want to thank uh, Lewis for the great presentation. I also want to thank everyone for participating in the event polling. And before uh, showing the upcoming events, uh, we're going to play a quick game and answer this uh, trivia question. Uh, we'll show the correct answer at the end of this session today. So let's see how many of you can get the correct response. Uh, Cisco Nexus 1000 and Coca-Cola, what do they have in common? A, Coca-Cola bottling company is preparing to use the Cisco Nexus 1000 vSwitch, which resides on the server, to deliver VNLink virtual machine-aware network services. B, Coca-Cola bottling company plans on using the Cisco Nexus 1000B to simplify, uh, simplify collaboration within the IT department by clearly separating responsibilities for the server group and network group. C, Coca-Cola bottling company plans on using the Cisco Nexus 1000 vSwitch to enable vMotion to work properly by giving server specialists the freedom to move hosts around without concerning themselves with quality of service and security settings. D, A and B only, or E, A, B, and C? So take a moment to see if you can guess that trivia question correctly. And this is going to conclude the Q&A portion of today's event. So those who fill out the evaluation survey that will be posted in your chat window uh, get a chance in a raffle for the chance to win one $50 Amazon gift card. And so you can access the survey at that, at that link in the chat window. As I said earlier, uh, Lewis will be answering your technical questions on this topic until June 14th. So you'll just go to the link in your chat window to ask more questions. Uh, also, all of our Ask the Expert events are available on the Cisco support community by just going to the Expert Corner and selecting the Ask the Expert tab. If you have not explored the Cisco support community, take a moment to check it out. It's an excellent resource, and it's located at https colon two forward slashes supportforums.cisco.com. And we will be posting the recording and the questions and answers from the webcast in the community at the link provided in the chat within five business days. We have a few different webcasts and events coming up. So the first one is in English, and it takes place on Tuesday, July 9th, and it's on Upgrading Cisco Unified Communications Manager to version 9.1. And uh, the registration will be open on June 10th. And you also have that in your chat window, but you can also go to the Cisco Support Community, Click on our Expert Corner and select the Webcast tab for all the registrations for our upcoming webcast events. The next one is in Spanish, and that takes place on June 12th, Introduction to Multi-Protocol Label Switching, Uses and Benefits. You can register at the same event link. Third one is in Portuguese, and that takes place on Tuesday, June 18th and it's on Border Gateway Protocol, Fundamentals, Configuration, and Troubleshooting. And we have a last one in Russian, and it takes place on Wednesday, June 19th, and it covers secure communication and certificates in Cisco Unified Communications Manager and Cisco Telepresence. We also have a few Ask the Expert events coming up in English. Uh, they're on the following topics, Jabber for Windows 9.2, Configuration and Features, Cisco Unified Wireless and Cisco Unified Access, Wireless LAN Controllers, How to Configure and Troubleshoot Open Shortest Path First, and Installing and Configuring Cisco Prime Collaboration 9.0. So you can join the discussion for those Ask the Expert events in the Expert Corner on the Cisco Support Community website, and also they'll paste the link in your chat window. Also, remember to join us at Cisco Live in Orlando, and that takes place June 25th through 27th. We will be in the World of Solutions and Services area located in front of the data center. And for information, you can go to that link for our Cisco Live page. We have uh, communities in other languages. If you speak Spanish, Portuguese, Japanese, Polish, or Russian, we invite you to ask your questions and collaborate in your language. We also invite you to actively collaborate in the Cisco support community and social media. Uh, we are on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Google+. Uh, we have our technical support apps on iTunes and also in the Android, Android Google Play Store. 
We are on LinkedIn, and you can also click on the link to subscribe to our newsletter. And now the trivia answer, and it was E. So it's A, B, and C. Cisco Nexus 1000 V-Switch is helping Cisco Coca-Cola to do all those things. So uh, before signing off, uh, please take a few minutes to complete your evaluation of today's session, and this will help us address your business needs and interests in the future. So this concludes our session today. Thank you to our expert, Louis Wada, for sharing his expertise with us today. Also, a big thanks to experts Robert Burns and Steve Winters for answering some of the technical questions. And we want to thank you, all of our attendees, and wish you a great day. <laughs>